Today, Dixie and myself, Antti, are going to talk about CPU affinity. That means that which set of CPUs should run which set of containers. Why it makes a big difference and how you can actually do it. So, when we already got our presentation accepted, I asked Dixie if she had some like, relevant workload in mind with which we could demonstrate the benefits of CPU affinity. She provided me with the Docker file for running TensorFlow AI model training on CPU. And we had a node, a Kubernetes worker node, uh, with this kind of hardware, maybe it's not, sorry, maybe it's not fully visible uh, there, but it's like a two socket system having 128 CPUs in it. And the uh, operating system was telling that, okay, there are two NUMA nodes here, like one CPU for one NUMA node, the other CPU for the other NUMA node. And when we went to the BIOS and enabled sub NUMA clustering, uh, then more details about this hardware was exposed to the operating system and it resulted in showing that you have eight NUMA nodes. So eight set of CPUs, eight memories. And that's something which makes a difference when we are assigning workload to these CPUs. So what I'm presenting here is a um, throughput from that AI model training when we are increasing the number of containers on that node that are doing the training in parallel. So in the beginning, we are running just a single container and there is no big difference in the throughputs in these three cases. So one case is we do not have any CPU affinity at all. The other one is that we are assigning these containers to a set of four CPUs each. Finally, there's a case with running a container on only two CPUs for each container. And when we were adding more containers on this node, already there's a big difference now when we are running eight containers, that is eight trainings concurrently. So line for no CPU affinity and then top lines for two and four CPUs. And when increasing the number of containers again, now up to 15 containers running in parallel, the jump is pretty clear when we are doing CPU affinity setting there. And if there is no CPU affinity, that is all TensorFlow trainings can see all the CPUs on the node, then this doesn't really increase throughput that much. And finally, when pushing to the limits, we are running 20 containers simultaneously there on the node. Uh, when I tried to push even more, that resulted in out of memory errors, so we do not have just enough memory for that purpose uh, this time. Um, but there we can see now maybe a small difference between two CPUs and four CPUs cases. So if we allowed using four CPUs for each training, we have a, a bit more variation there in the results than what we have with two CPUs. Anyway, it again gave a small throughput increase, and maybe not that small actually, to increase the number of containers. So I guess that this requires a need, like calls for an explanation where this extra performance is coming from when you are actually only limiting the number of CPUs that these workloads can see. So there are different sources for the extra performance. It depends on the case actually a bit at where it is coming from in which case. So first, data locality. We are allocating these CPUs where we find these containers so that they are all always close to some memory node. So all the memory accesses are to the most local fastest memory and that, that already improves performance a lot. The, uh, another point, cache hits. 
So uh, for each cache level, there is actually less users, less processes that sort of use the cache, that pollute the cache, in other words. And then also there are lacking the far away cache invalidation so that here some CPU would be reading memory from there and here would be writing memory from there and that write then invalidates the cache in this different socket even. Again, another reason is CPU frequency. So now that we are packing the workload to a smaller set of CPUs, it is more likely that there are some CPUs actually idle. And those idle CPUs can donate their power budget to those CPUs that are busy, which means that those CPUs will be running automatically with higher CPU frequency. You don't have to do anything for that to happen. Finally, workloads can be behave, <coughs> sorry, behave smarter when they don't see the whole system and when they don't think that they actually own the whole system. So some frameworks and runtimes may be like overwhelmed. That, oh, oh we, we have like 128 CPUs. That's a lot. Let's start a new thread for each CPU and let's take the advantage of all of those. Imagine that you are running 20 of this kind of workloads on your system and you have then 20 competing threads for each CPU core. When we split the CPUs to smaller sets, this doesn't happen. So now taking a step back from this single performance trial and trying to form a bigger picture that what we are actually talking about. So we are dealing and doing with the Kubernetes worker node scope we want to do CPU affinity for all QoS classes of workload, so guaranteed burstable and best effort. And our goals are both performance and isolation. And we are doing this by introducing a highly configurable uh, resource policy for assigning CPUs and containers. And this talk is addressing these well-known problems like data locality, noisy neighbor, device locality, CPU attributes. So we, we are going to allow also CPU frequency configurations for containers. And there is a lot of room and requests actually also for all sorts of application specific tweaking. To mention one, there was someone who wanted to run uh, virtual machines in their containers and each container would have like four CPUs. Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, would have four CPUs, but also so that we could run more virtual machines if we took these four CPU sets and run actually two containers on each set. So share each CP, four CPUs with two containers. So this is the beyond the default, and now Dixie, Let's start from what is the default and how we could get here. Thank you, Anting. Um, I'm going to talk about what are the different things that we use to achieve beyond default, and also how does it compare with the default. So if you have a pod spec YAML today, and you uh, apply that uh, using kubectl, what control pane would do is it determines that there is a need to create some containers. And then the scheduler would find the appropriate nodes that specify uh, that uh, have the capacity to run uh, your workload. And after that, the kubelet is in charge of uh, making sure that the containers are created. Kubelet would uh, take the resource request and limits from your uh, pod spec. And it would uh, communicate with the container runtime using the gRPC protocol that's specified in the container runtime interface. And from there, uh, the uh, resources are translated into the OCI uh, spec and OCI Linux resources spec, and it is forwarded to the run C, which is responsible for eventually creating the containers and writing, um, writing the resource spec and mapping those to the various C group uh, files. So this is uh, the pod spec that we used. Uh, that, that, that's the default for uh, our use case. Now, um, for us, what we wanted to do was we wanted to have a more granular control 
over the CPUs that would run our workloads. And today, uh, Kubernetes does have CPU manager, but the policies, different policies that would help us uh, manage the CPU sets allocation for our workload at a more granular level are kind of work in progress right now. So we used uh, NRI plugins to have something which is beyond default. NRI plugin uh, sit in the container, uh, along with the container uh, runtime layer. It would intercept the container uh, lifecycle events and make adjustments to the resource, resource policy and enable you to uh, specify the custom way to allocate the CPU resources. This is what uh, the balloon policy spec looks like for our use case. Um, so if you see, there is an option to specify uh, the option that says prefer spread on physical cores. Today, CPU manager in Kubernetes doesn't have this option. It's being worked on, and it will be available in 131. But uh, as of now, since it's not available, we use the balloon policy uh, in NRI plugin. And we have this option to specify uh, the CPU set allocation across different cores and not on the same core. And we also specified um, prefer new balloons. This help us uh, achieve some sort of isolation, since this configuration would create new balloons instead of uh, allocate instead of placing our workloads on the existing uh, CPUs and hence we were able to achieve some sort of uh, some level of isolation there using this and then we have namespaces star which would mean that all the workloads running on the node would comply with this balloon policy and um, there is also an option to specify annotations uh, at the pod spec level in case you would want that for your use case, but for our use case, at least we were we are running all the workloads that comply with this balloon policy. Um, let's walk over uh, how are we uh, doing the installation of the NRI plugin. So the first command would add the NRI plugin repository. The second one is the Helm install. It would um, install the NRI balloon daemon set and the CRD, and it would also um, take care of whatever is required for the uh, balloon policy plugin. And with the patch runtime config true, it would enable the functionality at the, uh, at the container runtime level. Uh, this functionality is default enabled uh, on container D 2.0 and further. And it is available on 1.7, uh, uh, but it's en enabled only in 2.0. And for the default balloon policy plugin, you can actually live tune it and edit it as per your needs. We use kubectl edit to uh, edit the balloon policy for our need. And so what we are trying to address is what's the need for uh, actually, uh, gr actually uh, granularly uh, specifying the CPU sets for the workloads. So there are different workloads that have different use cases and they might want to run, um, a user might want to run a particular set of workloads on particular CPUs while the other set of workloads on different CPUs without any interference across each others. So we do not have a lot of uh, different policies in the CPU manager today and NRI plugin solves that problem. Yep. And I will uh, walk over the next, the, the details about the balloon policy plugin and deep dive into it. Yeah, thanks. So here is what happens once you have installed NRI balance policy. The policy uh, daemon set, of course, it starts a pod on every, every node in your cluster. And each of these pods then uh, registers to the container runtime. So Cryo and Container D have this NRI server there. So in the registration, it tells to the runtime that which are the events pod and container lifecycle events that it is interested in. And the container runtime responds by telling that what are the running containers already. So if there are containers on that node already, then this plugin can already start adjusting those without restarting the containers. Once uh, the new containers are being scheduled and started on that node, then kubelet 
is telling to the runtime that now we are creating a new container. Runtime is saying and forwarding that event to the NRI plugin, and the plugin then does the assignment. So in this case, when the, there is like first container coming in, NRI balloons could create a new balloon, which is a new set of CPUs, and assign the new container on this balloon, so that this balloon contains enough CPUs to satisfy the CPU requests of that container that is coming in. And when, again, new container is being created, in addition to the previous one, then the balloons policy can inflate this balloon by adding one more CPU there so that it satisfies the CPU requests of both of these containers. And here I want to highlight that we are actually modifying the CPU set where this already running container is already uh, maybe already running, so it gets more CPUs to its use in this case when we are like inflating balloons. But not all workloads are happy with that. So some workloads may want to stick with the CPUs that they fir uh, first see when they are started, and we can't actually uh, then increase and decrease the number of CPUs uh, live in that case. And to address those, Palus policy also has options for having these kind of fixed set, fixed balloons, which have like a st static set of CPUs, and there can be even balloons that uh, are created without any containers being already there. But this is important for the cases where you know that this node is going to run some workload. Some edge cases, for instance, have these kind of situations where there is some special hardware where you want to ensure that you have CPUs reserved for your coming workload so that it can communicate very efficiently with that special hardware. Again, some more options. So balloons also allow doing these kind of things that you have some dedicated CPUs on two balloons, but you are also sharing some CPUs that are idle, so that those CPUs that do not belong to any balloon are shared with the workloads in these balloons. And you can specify the level in the uh, topology that where these idle CPUs are shared. So you can share idle CPUs in the same NUMA node, or you can share idle CPUs uh, on the same die or on the same socket or even the whole system if you like. So this, this gives the data locality when you specify, specify different topology levels there. Okay, so let's a bit compare the default and the beyond default cases. So in Kubelet managers, they manage currently guaranteed workloads only, while our goal with balloons is that you can run um, containers of any work, any QoS class in balloons. Another point is that managers currently give exclusive set of CPUs uh, per a container, or you can have a node level switch saying that you want an exclu exclusive set of CPUs per a pod. Uh, in balloons, we have exclusive and shared CPUs, and you can define any containers which should have which option. So, for instance, you can have like database pods, which contain two containers, like one database container and one logger container, and you can give exclusive set of CPUs for all the database containers, and then put all the logger containers from every pod to the same set of CPUs. Again, managers provide static CPU sets which do not uh, change during the runtime, which is safe, of course. Uh, Balloons offers also static and dynamic CPU sets, so if you, are, if you know your workloads that these are just fine to be adjusted when they are running, then, then fine, go with it and you can take advantage of it. Uh, topology levels. Managers support um, NUMA nodes, 
up to up to eight NUMA nodes, then there is some uh, algorithmic problems actually, which prevent using much more. Um, balloons policy detects like several topology layers. We have we know how, which are, cores are hyperthreaded. We know NUMA nodes. We know dice, which are basically uh, something that could run almost like a as a different CPU socket, but they are you can like pack several dice in the same package, so it's just a sub sub package, I would say, and then full packages of course, and you can share, as I mentioned, you can share idle CPUs, for instance, on any level that you just define in the configuration. In addition to that, we have C CPU frequency controls. We are implementing some CPU power controls as well, so that you can define for those CPUs in some balloon that's how the frequency and power should be uh, handled there. We can do cache level sharing in different levels and we can do live tuning. I would also, let's jump with the live tuning to another example. So now here I'm editing uh, balloons policy default. That is the default policy to be used on every node in the cluster but you can actually define also policies for separate nodes so that they have then a bit different balloons configurations. Um, I'm having here a balloon named Compress. This is my um, synthetic, synthetic benchmark, which with that I just want to de demonstrate that how, how you can do the configuring live. And I'm telling that maximum CPUs per each balloon is three and minimum number of CPUs per each balloon is three. That means that whenever a balloon is created, it will have three CPUs and no more, no less. And there's also the option that Dixie already mentioned, prefer spreading on uh, physical cores. That is when we are allocating these three CPUs for a balloon, we are picking up them from different physical cores so that they do not have sibling hyper threads in them. Uh, this is actually an option that I'm changing here in this live uh, tuning uh, results. So here's the baseline. Um, I'm just reading, reading random device, then just doing some base 64 encoding and uh, compressing and d doing it again. So a synthetic benchmark, as I mentioned. And uh, baseline throughput looks like that, without balloons policy, without any CPU affinity, no limits in, in those resources. When I apply balloons policy with min CPUs one, then it runs only on a single CPU and we get very flat line, so that's very predictable performance, but the throughput is definitely below what was here in the baseline. When I add a new, another CPU to this balloon, so change the min CPUs to two, I can immediately see a big in, increase in the throughput. And again, we get a flat line. So very predictable throughput, which is actually on average already above the baseline. Again, adding one more CPU, then we are getting some variation already there. I was thinking at that point that do we get this variation because of the uh, frequencies changes, so I changed actually minimum frequency for those CPUs in this balloon to the maximum that was available, but it didn't, didn't change the situation, so the same fluctuation was still there, uh, so which means that actually the CPU was already topped on those CPU cores that were used. Uh, so I tried out the other option, uh, changing this prefer spread on physical cores, and then I was able to see that okay, now the now the variation at least got a bit smaller, so it's it's more predictable predictable in that case. In this case, this uh, node didn't have much any any workloads to run, so this this sort of is an example of the one of the cases where I mentioned that where this extra performance is coming from. So this is actually coming from the fact that. Uh, you get higher CPU frequency when you are when you have few very busy CPU cores. So, Dixie, would you like to conclude? Sure. So, uh, again, what we are trying to say is 
Uh, there can be different use cases uh, in which a user would like to like their workloads to be placed, say, say for example, on disjoint CPU sets. There can be a workload that the user wants to uh, place on one CPU set, and the other workload should not maybe go on that CPU set for better performance. And say there can be a workload that should allocate that should have CPU allocation closer to the network device or the block device. So today. Uh, we do not have this level of uh, configuration options in Kubernetes. Some of them are being worked on, but uh, we use NRI plugin, which is able to provide us these options, and we achieve some sort of uh, uh, isolation as well, and mitigated some problems that we have around noisy neighbor. And NRI plugin is available in container D 1.7. It's enabled by default in 2.0. And uh, in cryo, it's available in 1.26. If you would like to try it out, feel free to. Next slide, please. We also have attached the uh, YAML files that we used for you to try at home in case you would like. And the most important thing, if you would like to contribute to NRI or different resource policies or Kubernetes Signode, we have added the links here. The first two are for the NRI. Uh, I have also added a couple of more links, which I will upload later. So uh, there are a bunch of open issues in Kubernetes. One is around adding a new CPU manager static policy that will help you to place your workloads across different CPU cores. There is another one which kind of tries to address uh, adding CPU policies that will enable you to configure different C group options uh, such that you can have different uh, Requi different requirements satisfied for CPU allocation. And if you would like to learn more about what we are doing in Signode, please attend the maintainers track on Friday. And here is the QR code for feedback. And we are open for questions. Thanks uh, for great performance. Um, imagine that you have uh, a lot of different deployments, thousands of deployments, and you have hundreds of Kubernetes nodes. And now you have to decide how to split them into balloons, how to choose the optimal uh, sizes of balloons, how to understand that in such a dynamic environment where you can have a lot of different deployments. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Very good question. Um, I think that uh, eventually it boils down to measuring. So if you want to know how to really optimize and how to squeeze out everything out of your node, you need to try it out. I, I can't tell you that what, what would be the magic solution for that. There are good defaults. So we, we can provide you with uh, different policies actually. So we are presenting here only NRI uh, balance policy, but uh, there is also available NRI topology aware policy, which is like a zero configuration policy. Here in the balance policy, you are defining different balloon types, CPU settings for each. So it's a lot of configuration options, which really are, help you in squeezing out the every single bit of the performance. But with a topology aware policy, you just deploy the policy and enjoy the, <laughs> the topology awareness. So you will get the, like NUMA node alignment uh, and lots of things for free without, without bothering with the configuration. Thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, very good presentation. It's very flexible, seems. Uh, when you mention this topology awareness, is, is it count uh, device uh, NUMA topology awareness if I want to schedule it on the same uh, NUMA node when my NIC is taking ingest, for example? Uh, these policies do not really uh, affect the Kubernetes scheduler, so there is a gap there, just like with the default policies currently as well. So it might be that you are not getting exactly what you wish, and then, then your port might be like uh, failed to run. That, so that's, that's the lowest option. Like if you say that my port should be run in this and this balloon, but that balloon is, can't be created anymore on the node, then the, the scheduling will fail. 
okay. uh, running it will fail. Okay, but in principle, the topology manager will do something and then in, in the right plugin, either perform it or fail. Uh, are you talking about the kubelet topology yeah, I mean, manager? If, if oh. topology manager of a cube and force oh. the Puma node. Okay, sorry, sorry. Um, I would say that do not use, if you are using NRI uh, topologies, uh, sorry, NRI resource policies like topology manager NRI or, or balloons, you should not use kubelet topology manager, no kubelet CPU manager or memory manager at all. So just switch those off and because it, it would be otherwise just a waste of time. Okay. They, their suggestions are completely like uh, thrown away by these NRI policies. Okay, I see. Uh, one short, another question. Can you exclude some CPUs from scheduling? Um, you, can ex you can annotate your port saying that do not touch the CPU sets uh, or memories that this is uh, using. So this is, uh, again, great question, thanks. Uh, there are cases where your workload might need access to every single CPU core that is available in the system. So for instance, when you are taking measures and uh, accessing these, like CPU counters, hardware counters on each CPU, you can't do that without having access to all of those. And with th these kind of special cases, you can say that uh, this workload is special, don't put it into any balloon, just let it run everywhere. Um, I would like to add a bit more here. So we were having a discussion as to what would happen if a pod is already scheduled uh, on a node, and then uh, the, the balloon policy plugin tries to inflate or deflate uh, CPUs, and those CPUs are not available on the node. So again, I would say the balloon policy uh, plugin would fail here. So there is an ongoing discussion about whether uh, these things should be at the kubelet level so that uh, the scheduler is aware of uh, what resources are attached to the node and then makes the decision there, or whether it should be at the container runtime level. I have a different opinion about this. So we just have, uh, we were just having this discussion and I just wanted to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's work together. Hello, I have a couple of questions. So um, the first one, are there any defining workload as you will? Are there any workloads which you've seen no benefit at all or even like degradation with your plugin? I haven't seen that before. I, I mean, we have done some experiments with like both synthetic uh, CPU, so, some of which are very intensive to CPU, some which are memory bound. We have done like benchmarks on uh, in-memory databases and all of them so, so actually benefits so far. So I haven't seen this kind of case. Though if, if something comes up, I, I'd be very glad to know about it. All right, thank you. Um, my last question is, so I see your in, in your demo, so you're a, a data scientist, you run your um, cluster. So you can say, I want this workload on these you know, cores and these on another. So my, my use case is I've got a cluster and 100 teams and I have no real control over that. So I can't create static policies per se. Is there any plans to, for example, just create lots of balloons and then have something scheduled like this balloon has less load so let's move some containers over. Actually, yeah, we have discussed uh, and we have such plans to like sort of migration of workloads between balloons and also the other way around, so exchanging CPUs. If some balloon is getting very loaded on CPUs and then other, other is quite idle, then why not move CPU to between balloons? So these kind of considerations have been done. They are not implemented yet though. Okay, I think, do you have any aspiration date for that or? Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Okay. No, thank you. Hello. Hey. Um, Intel has the new uh, processor with three uh, core types. Um, how is that going to work? Y you will get uh, uh, options for selecting these kind of different core types. But so not, it, there, not there yet, but okay. coming. Thank you.
Hey, thanks. So I have two quick questions. I mean, one is not quick, one is more quick. So how is the discoverability of what balloons is the pod attached to, for example? Is it something that you can see in a status field or like what kind of pods are assigned to this balloon or? Great question. So for this kind of, it's sort of debugging purposes currently, we are providing a metrics interface. So that can be enabled in Balloon's configuration that you can get like Prometheus metrics interface where you can see that which containers run in which balloons, which CPUs are assigned to which balloons and which like extra idle CPUs might be allowed to be used by the containers in a balloon if, if this kind of share, I, sorry, idle CPU sharing is enabled. So it's, uh, we, we, do it, we, we do it with curl currently on the node that is running this balloon's policy. So if, if you have some good ideas that how this could be exposed, I would be also very glad to get those ideas, even like a GitHub issues or something like that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one thing could be a status field on either the balloon or, I mean, the balloon policy would be easier, but yeah, we can talk about it later. Yeah. Um, the next question is sort of like more general. How do you say this coexists with the array, right? Because it feels somehow like a little bit similar, like, right, we have some um, dynamic resource allocation, in this case, CPU, right? Uh, sorry, how, how this cooperates with, what did you mean? DRA. So, DRA. Ah. You mentioned you also have some gaps, right, in scheduler and everything. I think in some, it's some areas where they are trying to, to solve. Yeah, I think that these are quite different topics. Sasha, you, see, you look like you want to comment something into this, so maybe I give mic to you. Uh, yes, uh, so simple answer, it's not anyhow connected with DRA. A bit more uh, complex answer is what DRA is handling the allocation of a device, so for example, like GPU. So DRA says use this particular GPU one and GPU two. NRI starts when the uh, container is created and at that stage the device is all already selected. So what we can do on NRI level is what we can see what kind of devices are used and when we can find the needed pair of CPU cores or memory regions which is close to that device. So it happens practically like behind the scenes. And that's actually an answer to a previous question about the topology manager. So topology manager tries to dictate what CPU to use, what memory region to use, and so on. Here is the opposite. So you first select what kind of device you are trying to use, and we will find the memory and CPU regions to accommodate the best wet accelerator device. So that's the connection between those two things at the moment. Okay, now it looks we are running out of time. So I time to thank you for your attention. Great questions, thank you. Thank you.